Today is December 7, a day that went down in the infancy, 1941. A few years later, there was a young man by the name of Desmond Doss, and his story, when it came out after the Second World War, I found entirely fascinating. Do you know about him? Yes. You do? Okay. You know that as a young boy, he studied the Ten Commandments that were on a chart in his parents' home. And there were two that stuck in his mind. The first one was, thou shalt not kill. And he determined that he would never kill, regardless. The second one was the fourth commandment. And he determined he would never break it. And along comes the war. And he is drafted. And that's where the problems began. The army didn't know what to do with him. Because... He wasn't about to take a gun, and he wasn't about to break the fourth commandment. And so they went their rounds. He was a very stubborn young man. And the officers were stubborn, but they weren't stubborn enough. And so he went through training. He called himself a, con a conscientious cooperator. He would cooperate. He was a medic. His job, save lives. They did their best to get out, rid of him. Finally, they had to be reminded that the president had signed an article that Seventh-day Adventists were not to be forced to carry a gun. And that had to be brought to the attention of his commanding officers. And so they boarded a ship, they headed out. They went to Guam first, then to Layette, and then to Okinawa. Their job was to take an escarpment, an escarpment that was mined by the Japanese. During the day, the Japanese were under a cover in the caves on Okinawa. And the GIs took the escarpment. Japanese came out at night and we lost it. They called for cargo nets and Desmond Doss was one of those who took the cargo nets up a skinny ladder and hung it so that they could crawl up. During that time Every time someone was wounded, he was there. Always ready. If a group needed to go out, they got to the point where they asked for Desmond Doss to go with them. On one occasion, they had a group going out. It was on a Sabbath. And they said, would you go? The commander came to him and he says, let me finish reading my Bible. They held up the war while he read his Bible and he went. On that patrol, no one was lost. Finally, they were told they had to take the escarpment. And so they did. It was a slaughter. Desmond Doss was on top. They said, you have to come down. He said, no. While he was in basic, he learned to tie a knot. Do you know the name of the knot?
He tied a double bowline lot. He didn't realize that it was going to come in very handy on Okinawa. It had two loops instead of one. This is what he used to lower 100 men from the top of that escarpment down. 55 of them were already at the bottom. When he got down and was told what he had done, he says, I didn't. He says, there's no way I could do that. He said he did 50. The army said, we'll settle for half, 75. But there were 100 men on top. All of them were lowered down. For his this, he was um, nominated for the Medal of Honor. It was given to him by Harry Truman, whose comment was, you should stand where I am. Only three medics have ever received the Medal of Honor, and Desmond Doss was the first. His story has always fascinated me. He stood for what he believed, regardless. And when he was finally wounded and carried to ship, he suddenly discovered that he'd lost his Bible and he sent word back, if you find my Bible, send it to me. When the battle for Okinawa was over, the men back, went back and retraced his steps, and they found his Bible, and they sent it to him. Good morning. I don't want this eyeglasses to bother me. Um, last week, Lori uh, Ulrich did a uh, wonderful uh, sermon, and my uh, sermon is also related to um, what she has talked about, but mine is more of, uh, in the nature, of personal testimony, and um, I thought it was very appropriate, December 7th, you know what December 7th is. Uh, people used to celebrate December 7th as an infamous day uh, of the war, you know. And um, anyway, um, I would like to testify about what God has done for me as a child living in Japan during the war. Um, I was born in Mountain View, California in 1937 and um, to a family where um, there were four girls four sisters and I'm the last last one and uh, only boy my parents were very unusual type of people okay they um, came from two different, totally different type of family. My father was a son of a fisherman. His ancestors were samurai um, family, you know, samurai, tall, big people. My father was uh, 6'1". For Japanese, that's pretty big. I never got there because my mother was only about five feet tall. My mother was uh, from a family that um, was titled, like in England, you know, you have titles, and uh, equivalent to baron 
Okay. So she was raised by um, servants, not not by her parents, basically. Uh, when she went to school as a grade school uh, student, student uh, the uh, servant will carry her on his back so that she, she her feet will not get wet if it were raining or whatever um, it was that kind of a environment she lived in and uh, she told me that uh, she never ate vegetables or anything just meat and fish and you know all those rich food well my father um, came to the United States at age 16. His two uncles were um, landscape um, gardeners in um, Hollywood area, working on these uh, movie actors' homes, you know, landscaping. Anyway, um, he needed a wife, so he wrote to wrote to his parents, I suppose, and uh, they had a meeting arranged. And uh, it's usually like a pic picnic, you know, and you have a lunch and so on and so forth. Well, my mother told me that um, she married my dad because uh, she liked the way he laughed. Good, good reason, right? Anyway, uh, so their marriage was kind of unusual for um, title person's family. It was a poor fisherman's family. My father was a very um, successful businessman in San Francisco, and he had a, a good food um, business, well, you call that grocery stores right now, right? Not supermarket, because they didn't have that kind of thing. So. And um, so he, he married my mother. She came to the United States at the age, uh, let's see, I think 18. And she um, she didn't know anything about anything. I mean, she didn't know how to cook, how to do washing, how to take care of babies. Of course, you know, like anybody else, I mean, she got pregnant immediately, right? So um, my sister was born when my mother was 19. Uh, I think it was 1926, about there. And um, so she needed help. Well, she, she was living, by the time um, I was born, in, born, they were living in Mountain View, California, but I'm not sure when my uh, parents moved to Mountain View. My, my sister... My mother didn't know how to take care of her, so um, she hired a nurse. And this nurse was a Caucasian lady, very nice lady. And she was such a nice person. My mother was wondering what made, him, made her so nice. And she said she was a Seventh Adventist Christian. And my mother says, I want to be a seventh element this. And um, then a, another person she hired was a Japanese lady, about the age of her own mother. And uh, she was also kind, very kind. And she asked what makes her so nice. And again, she found out she was a seventh element this. So she wanted to be a seventh element this. Well, my father uh, told me that when he was living in San Francisco was another guy uh, sharing the apartment. There was a Japanese Seventh Adventist minister that used to come around. 
And um, they didn't appreciate it, really. They didn't like it, but they didn't know how to say it. <laughs> so what they did was they um, put the broom upside down in the next room. That means you chase the devil away, all right? And so they expected the uh, minister not to come around. But he came around. He was some time this minister. This minister happened to, um, when he was a young man, worked for Ellen G. White in Oakland as a schoolboy. And he became a Seventh Adventist minister. Uh, the name is uh, Eldo Nozaki. He lived to age 104, so he lived a long time. But anyway, my parents became some of that, my mother became some of that at age 19. And um, she became a total vegetarian. Remember I told you she was a um, fish and meat eater, no vegetable? And she just immediately changed. I take it back. She was not a total vegetarian. She uh, was lacto ovo vegetarian, eating eggs and milk. But anyway, um, she lived that way for 61 years, 61, 62 years until her death. Um, my father uh, found out that the, there was going to be a war between the United States and Japan. And the reason why he knew about this was because two of my uncles were uh, admirals in the Imperial Navy. And uh, one of them was responsible for oil depot in Japan. And um, he told my dad that um, Japan wants to attack the United States, but um, there was not enough fuel to send the ship to this country. And so um, he urged my father to leave because otherwise he'll be a war prisoner, not just concentration camp, I mean just war prisoner. And so my dad sent myself and my four, uh, three sisters and my mother to Japan in April, April 1941. I was four years old. And um, I got to Japan and, and then the war started shortly after. And uh, things got really bad, really bad. And because of the fact that I was an American citizen, born in America, spoke English, people didn't take very kindly to that. And uh, of course I started going, going to school and the war got worse and worse. It was so bad that um, you know, every once in a while we had to stop whatever we were doing and escape to get into the air raid shelter. And uh, if we were in school, they sent us home so that we can be with parents. And um, because I was an American citizen and much taller than most kids, um, I would meet a group of uh, students waiting for me to beat me up. They will surround me and start hitting me every day. And uh, so I had to learn how to defend myself. Well, I would hit the guy in front of me, and while he's kind of a, you know, dizzy, I would run and run, run between the fences and uh, behind the house and all kinds of stuff. And I had a terrible claustrophobia at those days because, you know, I mean, you're escaping for your dear life. I came home crying one day. 
And my father said to me, I'll teach you how, what it means to cry. If you're going to fight, fight till you're dead or the other person is dead. But don't fight unless you're willing to do that. So I never came home uh, crying. But nevertheless, uh, this, this was how it was, the life in Japan. And then, war got so bad that, um, you know, people didn't have much food to eat or anything like that. We were expecting uh, some, some invasion by Americans on the beach. And every family had uh, big, a long bamboo um, pole with a sharp edge on it. And uh, that was the only weapon everybody had so that if the Americans landed, that was the only thing they could fight. And um, nevertheless, the air raid, air raid uh, became very, very, um, Frequent, you could see American uh, planes flying over uh, overhead, like uh, B-29s in the formation. And I would wear my red cap and uh, lie down on the roof and watch them fly. <laughs> and I don't know why I wore my red cap, but anyway, uh, they didn't drop any bomb on me. You know, I'm just looking at airplane flying but it got to the place where um, one day I was uh, standing on up, I was in the upstairs looking over the uh, ocean and I saw small I mean a group of airplane flying low and I saw it come around and I said I ran downstairs and I said, the airplane is, I mean, American plane is coming. Well, at that time, because of the fact that they were expecting uh, American invasion, uh, all the big houses were taken over by um, Japanese Navy. They they came in and took over, right? Like we had 12 rooms and we were only given two rooms for us, and the rest of the rooms were taken by uh, Japanese Navy. And um, all this has some, something to do with what God has done for us, okay? Um, because these navies were there, um, and they made a headquarter for Navy office. And so that... Um, even though people around us were starving, the um, Navy officers had all kinds of food. I mean, they brought the back bucket full of uh, fresh cooked <coughs> rice every meal. And uh, of course, you can't eat that much rice. And so uh, my mother would uh, make rice ball and um, sneak it to some of these soldiers who were drafted. They were in their 40s, you know, and they were drafted, so uh, they were not used to working and hard work and getting just a little soup and maybe a few drops of uh, rice. Um, they were suffering, so my mother wouldn't sneak the rice ball and give it to them, you know, in the back door. And, um, but anyway, in that way, um, we were provided, God provided for us during the war when, you know, there weren't much food. And um, one day I was coming home from school and, um, I know some of you probably heard it, but uh, P-38, you know, the P-38 came screaming down behind me 
And I was about eight, I think, seven or eight, and um, screaming down, and I looked and started shooting machine gun. And you could see the machine gun bullet hit the uh, dirt road. And uh, he missed me, so he came around again and started shoot, uh, shooting at me. Um, these are the things that we went through in the uh, war. And in this country, we have, we have never had people come and invade like that, at least in our lifetimes, all right? And um, so um, we were, remember a little while ago I said that plane was coming around when I was upstairs? Well, these Navy guys um, were wearing white shirt and dark pants, and they, were, they went out and looked, and you could see the... Uh, P-51, um, single pilot, coming down and uh, taking a dive. You could see the pilot, and then machine gun bullet, you know, shooting be between the prop, and um, and then they will go screaming up the hill, and then come around. And we watched that, but then pretty soon they came closer and closer to our house, so they said, okay, we better get undercover. Well, we had a whole bunch of um, suitcases and boxes ready to move to the country because it was dangerous for us to stay there. Well, we haven't moved yet, and um, so we got under blanket, you know, stone, Japanese blanket, and Navy guys have holding it but shaking like a leaf. You know, they're scared because American planes are flying over and shooting. And uh, my mother would open the Bible to uh, Psalm 34-7, which Lori um, used last week. Um, Psalm 34-7. Okay. okay. All right. And she's reading this uh, Bible to these non believers, Navy men. And it was like the angel of the Lord and and compass all around those who fear him and deliver them. Or Psalms 91, 7. Similar uh, text. And I have personally experienced this text fulfilled. 91, 7 says, A thousand may fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. So you see, um, God uh, protected us, and um, I don't know what happened to these Navy men after the war, but at least they were exposed to these texts, and I have never forgotten those um these promises in the Psalms. Um, after the war, well, when the war was over, uh, Japanese officers left a whole bunch of uh, Japanese beer at our house. My father had a shed in the back, back he built and so they had a shed full of Japanese beer in the back <laughs> in our backyard, and um, 
my father didn't drink. We didn't drink. So when my sister, who was 16 at the time, was coming home from school, two American soldiers were following her. And they were saying something to the effect that, oh, I wish I can drink some water. My sister turned around and said, why don't you come come to our house and uh, we'll give you something to drink. And they said, well, your father is going to kill, kill me. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, this is a little fisherman village. How do you, how can they expect a Japanese girl, 16, to be speaking English, right? <laughs> anyway, they came over and my father thought that Americans cannot drink regular water so he offered Japanese beer that was it once you they find out you have Japanese beer all the soldiers from all different places were one group was here one group was here and uh, they had a sea rations you know what sea rations is and a whole bunch of American uh, candies and food and stuff. They had a pocket full of them, and they'll put them all just to get a drink of a beer. And so God provided for us even during the, um, after the war, it was uh, all these good provision, good food. And some of the soldiers were... Uh, Bakers, for instance, and uh, used to bring us the um, fresh baked bread, which was not available, I mean, I mean, to most people. So, you know, soon we're going to face this kind of a things, and even in this country, you know that, that the um, world is getting pretty bad. And uh, we're going to be really tried hard. But we should remember that God is going to be good to us. I mean, if we trust him, he will take care of us. Um, One story I have to tell you that um, I get emotional when I do that, by the way. One day, right after the war, a convoy of American soldiers, all dressed in the military um, fatigue and carrying rifles, went through our town in the evening. And the people didn't know what to expect, you know. War was just ended, and uh, people were fearful and so uh, you could you could have you ever had experience or you can hear a silence I mean you can hear people there watching but they're fearful and and you know you just feel it well they were very afraid so nobody turned on their lights and you know the convoy went through Um, and this is just a little fisherman village and half an hour later the convoy came back and what do you think happened stopped right in front of our house and (laughs) we heard this bang 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 on the door and uh, my father says okay so he went out my mother said, are you sure you want to go out? My father said, sure, don't worry. So he goes out. As soon as he went out, six, five or six soldiers whose rifle went click, click, surrounded him. And my father started talking, you know, broken English and all. He said, don't worry. I had a business in San Francisco. And um, he told, he said, but where, you know, and, uh, and um, he said, um, 
I lived in America for a long time. Well, one of the soldiers who had a rifle pointed at my father said he remembered, he remembers him because when he went to do errand for his mother, my dad would always give him candies. And uh, he remembered that. Anyway, they all put down their rifles. And uh, what my point here is that be good to people anytime because you don't know what's going to happen to you later. You know, a little kindness would come back and pay off because when the, when the um, soldiers left, they threw a whole bunch of soap and different things they had inside our fence. So next morning, we find all these things that we couldn't get very easily. Just, just by giving the skin candies, he remembered my dad. And, and of course, by doing that, all the soldiers were waving, you know, when they left. They were waving at us and everything. So my testimony is um, that when we have an opportunity to do good to people, do it. Because no matter how small the person may be today, he may be able to help you when you need the help. And um, the time is slipping by. So I know I was going to say a lot more because, you know, um, if you don't understand the background, Japanese background, like a samurai code of conduct is completely different from Seventh Adventist code of conduct. And um, being the only son in my family, I was given the um, responsibility to carry on the name and uh, make sure that I would not disgrace my parents' name. And if anybody else did, I was supposed to revenge or, you know, do this totally different from Christian teaching. But God has been good to me, uh, even though I was at times not very good Christian. I, um, I was sinning and everything. But God listened to my mother's prayers and um, he brought me back and it took many years before I could understand what God's love was. But he loves us and he gives us great promises. There are two, two texts that I would like to read. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And, and um, when we face these trials and tribulations predicted in the Bible, 
that we should keep that promise in your mind because he's going to be with us wherever we go and whatever we go through. Next one is 1 John 2.25. Okay, 2.25. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Everything that God measures a time by is based on eternal life. He's not particularly um, interested in our present life because we know this is just a temporary life. And so, please don't give up, okay? Please believe in His promise and um, keep your faith. Thank you.